I know what you're thinking and I could have tried something new, something a bit different. I could have experimented with a few styles, but ultimately when you've got as many greys as I have, you just want them all gone. Anyway, technically speaking, we don't really talk about Cotard syndrome that much in psychology. It's one of those rare disorders. So little explanation is required. Uh, recently, the YouTube channel Ask a Mortician, hosted by Caitlin Doherty, uh, had a video on Cotards, and it sort of it, it changed how I viewed this this rare psychological curiosity. And I found myself looking for more information and, and reading a bit more and ended up digging a bit more into the subject. Um, not quite six feet deep, but, you know, deep enough. So, first things first, what is Cotard syndrome? Well, named after the French neurologist Jules Cotard, who described the syndrome in 1880 after attending a patient named Mademoiselle X, it is an exceptionally rare mental condition broadly defined by the patient's belief that they are, well, dead. Like, an honest and genuine belief that they have legitimately died, and the fact that they are still walking and talking instead of being buried causes them great distress. Often this belief is accompanied by other delusions relating to the patient's body, which can vary from person to person, with one patient believing they had no teeth or hair, while another refused to take a shower for fear that their body would disintegrate in the water and be washed away. These delusions are what define Cotard syndrome, and they develop through several stages. The first stage is known as the germination stage, and is when the delusion first begins to form, typically alongside paranoid and depressive symptoms such as suicidal ideation. Some patients start refusing food at this point, often because they feel like their digestive system has shut down and thus won't be able to digest it, while other patients develop this in the next phase, the blooming stage. This stage is characterised by anxiety and agitation, as well as sensory impairments such as the loss of taste and smell, and while the more paranoid and depressive symptoms start to diffuse, they are often replaced by more personal delusions involving such things as organs shutting down or disappearing altogether. Finally, there is the chronic stage in which the symptoms become, well, chronic, assuming that no treatment is ongoing at this time. Cotard syndrome has also been seen to be comorbid with several other rare and unique disorders such as lycanthropy and capgrass delusion in which a person believes that somebody close to them, such as a parent or partner, has been replaced by an imposter. Data about Cotards is incredibly rare, so its prevalence is unknown, but it does appear to be slightly more common in women than men, and is typically found in the elderly, though it has been known to occur in adolescents as well. Cotards is typically treated with either medication, such as antidepressants or mood stabilisers, or through a combination of medication and a course of ECT, which most patients tend to respond well to. Alright, so I don't mean to sound like a smart ass know-it-all, it's accidental, I can assure you. Uh, but I <laughs> I knew about Qatar's syndrome before the video. And it had always just been one of those um, interesting factoids that I could pull out at parties, you know, because I'm cool like that. And I, so I never thought I would see it much in my professional career. I never thought I'd read much about it in papers. It's a very rare thing. And as such, the odds of me encountering it in my life were close to zero so I just thought it would always be one of those little known oh yeah you know some people suffer from this it's very rare and unique sort of syndromes uh, but then Caitlin showed the results of a PET scan of a 48 year old man with catards and this is the thing that changed everything for me this this image this scan completely changed how I viewed this syndrome and because it's a brain scan you know what that means Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and everybody else, no matter what your gender identity, are you ready to dive deep into the mind and unravel all its secrets and mysteries? Because it's the neuropsychology bit. This is the scanning question, and unless you're familiar with various scans of the brain and what they should look like, it's difficult to appreciate how shocking this scan actually is. So to help, let's compare it with some other scans and see how brain activity should look on a PET scan. But these are just a couple of various scans, and as you can see, the bits of the brain that are doing their thing show up as various hues of red and orange, depending on how much glucose metabolism is going on, while blues and black areas show no metabolism and thus no activity. And 
This is why the scan of the patient with Cotard syndrome is so shocking. This much cognitive inactivity in these areas simply does not happen if you're up and about and talking to a doctor. This is a level of cognitive inactivity that is seen in patients who are under general anaesthetic, people in comas and Burnley fans. Assuming you've got a normal brain and aren't say a patient with Alzheimer's that these parts of the brain should be doing something they should show some metabolism taking place as the brain consumes energy so why isn't anything happening in this patient's brain especially considering that something should be as he's been to a GP previously he's taken several psychological tests before the scan and even given the authors of the paper his informed consent the man's clearly awake and conscious and able to interact with people in a manner that suggests no obvious cognitive impairment the authors considered that the medication the patient was taking at the time of the PET scan might have influenced their findings but conclude that the existing evidence suggests that this cannot explain the extent or severity of the results the psychological tests he'd taken before the scan indicated severe depression Indeed, the patient had previously had a short depressive illness in his medical history and had attempted suicide eight months previous. But depressive disorders display a more complex pattern of hypo and hypermetabolism across the brain, not the widespread hypometabolism seen here. In fact, the only regions of the brain to show hypermetabolism in this patient were the, the so-called lower regions of the brain, like the brainstem, the cerebellum and the thalamus. These are the parts of the brain that control our autonomic functions like breathing and movement. So they're still sending information to the rest of the body and processing the information they're getting back like normal. It's just that there's apparently nobody working in the offices above them. The areas of the brain affected by catards, and I'm not highlighting any particular reason, this is purely performative, uh, encompass a wide variety of processes linked to our conscious awareness, including what's known as the default mode network. Now, these are several areas of the brain that when we're doing something which involves us having to actively pay attention, generally aren't that active, but they kick in and start processing and becoming more active when we're sitting there doing nothing. So basically when we're in our default mode. Um, Catards also affect several areas involved in patients with disorders that involve altered states of consciousness, such as epilepsy, uh, as well as regions that are involved in higher processes involving our sense of self, our core consciousness, and you know, the other higher functions that are involved in us contemplating where we are in the universe, contemplating where we are in reality, just basically knowing ourselves, that all those higher meta thought processes uh, also affected by catards. Um, basically, if you think of it in terms of cogito ergo sum, the cogito is not happening, so the sum cannot follow. And uh, also, uh, anyone at Swizzles, I know I've been harping on about a certain sugary orange drink, but anyone at Swizzles wants to sponsor me? I really love double lollies, and I will happily sell my soul for a bunch of these. So let's lighten the mood by returning to depressive and psychotic disorders for a little while longer. Since catards is so rare, most of the literature about it is individual case reports. And there are so many of these which involve some form of depression within the patient's medical history. Of course, this doesn't mean that if you have depression that you're going to develop catard syndrome. But if you have catard syndrome, the odds are that you've previously been depressed. Bipolar disorder is also common in cases of catards, with many patients either having been treated for it previously or currently receiving treatment at the time of their diagnosis of catard syndrome. This treatment is usually in the form of antidepressants or mood stabilisers, though which type and how strong varies from patient to patient. Once again, not everyone with bipolar disorder goes on to develop catards, but many people with catards have or have previously had bipolar disorder. There's some evidence to suggest that young people who develop catards are at higher risk of developing bipolar disorder in later life, but like much in the medical literature about catards, this isn't conclusive and further research is required. Now, though it's not a depressive disorder, schizophrenia is also commonly comorbid with Cotard syndrome. And again, not everybody with schizophrenia, not everybody with Cotard, so on and so on. But interestingly though, schizophrenia typically involves delusions that are external in nature. There's some outside force or manifestation being responsible for the patient's distress. Whereas Cotard syndrome delusions are typically internal, like organs are missing or the body is dead, and thus the patient's distress stems from the inside. Given that it is comorbid with both affective and psychotic disorders, there is much debate as to whether Cotard syndrome should be considered an affective disorder like depression or a psychotic one like schizophrenia. 
The first attempt at an evidence-based classification of catards was made by Berrios and Luck in 1995, who described the syndrome as three distinct groups depending on how the symptoms manifest. The first group consisting of patients with a form of psychotic depression, which prominently features anxiety, melancholia and auditory hallucinations. Catard syndrome type 1, in which patients display the hypochondriac and nihilistic delusions but without any accompanying affective disorders. And Catard syndrome type 2, in which a mixture of both affective and psychotic delusions are present. For the time being, however, the DSM-5 and the ICD-10 don't consider Cotard syndrome as a separate and distinct entity, tending to group it in with other delusional disorders, such as those falling under the schizophrenia spectrum. Some cases of Cotard syndrome also include some form of trauma to the brain in the months leading up to the manifestation of symptoms. The case in Butler's paper had previously experienced hematomas and hemorrhaging and took several months to recover from this before symptoms manifested, while Young et al.'s 1992 paper described a patient who had previously experienced an injury affecting areas in his right cerebral hemisphere and his frontal lobes. But it should be pointed out here that, in most cases, structural changes to the brain in this manner are absent. Brain injury alone cannot serve as a cause of Cotard syndrome. Gonna end with uh, pure speculation on my part now because I had a lot of thoughts while I was writing this and there's just so much that I read and so little conclusive information out there. So I, I just thought I need to get this out. Um, given how comorbid uh, Cotard is with other syndromes, I do wonder if sometimes it is misdiagnosed because it is statistically more likely that someone has bipolar disorder or schizophrenia than catards at the moment so maybe you know maybe it does get misdiagnosed um there may also be cultural attitudes towards mental illness and, and death that, that sort of prevent people from coming forward and seeing the gps and being diagnosed i'm going to plug caitlin dotty again because she um she also works for the stay still she also works for the Order of the Good Death and they promote positive death attitudes and a better you know, approach to how we discuss and deal with death. And maybe that is one of the reasons why people don't come forward and visit their GPs and, and we can't get the data. Um, I know you can say that about most things. Um, it's hard to get people to open up about depression and anxiety and those are far more common. Um, but given that Qatar is so unique and that it's so tied up in what we typically consider to be a taboo subject um, maybe that's a, a stronger force maybe it's a stronger influence on people not coming forward and thus us not knowing true pre prevalence of catards um, also if that PET scan is representative of catards then you know, it's difficult to describe other things as potential symptoms or causes not symptoms, I need symptoms later it's potential causes at the moment because they all have different activity in the brain they all make different parts do different things they all have their own you know way of firing off different parts an expert can look at a brain scan and say that person's got bipolar disorder given the pattern that it leaves behind um and you know catards doesn't you don't have that with catards so maybe maybe instead what's going on is as catards develops and it consumes more, it subsumes more and more of the brain, maybe those disorders are actually symptoms of like that part of the brain finally being consumed by catards and being shut down. And then it manifests as bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or, you know, paranoia or melancholia. You know, this, see, I, I don't want to say because I'm not a neurologist and, you know, I am sort of slightly regretting not specializing in it because I do find it far more interesting than I thought I would and apparently I'm adapting better to it than I thought because originally I found it difficult and anyway um but I'm not a neurologist and there's currently so little data about catards that it's difficult to make that sort of call and for that reason maybe we should talk about catards a bit more uh -huh. I wouldn't be the man of impeccably bad musical taste that I am if I didn't mention Per Ingvar Olin at this point. Um, per is better known by the stage name Dead. He was the lead singer of Mayhem until 1991. Uh, he was convinced he died as a child uh, following a ruptured spleen and internal bleeding, which saw him have to rush to hospital. And he claimed he died on the uh, operating table for several minutes. And 
Um, he he was convinced he was dead, and as a result, he had a fascination with death and all things related. He was seen as a very morbid person, and he would act in strange ways. Like he would spend a lot of time in the woods. He he would claim he belonged in the woods. Um, he would bury his clothes before gigs, and then dig them up so that they would be like rotten and decaying. On uh, one tour, he found a dead bird, so he he kept that with him. He carried it around in a bag, and he would inhale it take deep breaths from this bag before performing and he claimed it was so he could sing with the stench of death in his nostrils uh, he's often been credited as the first person to sort of like popularize the wearing of corpse paint which is this thing <laughs> this look um but according to necro butcher who's mayhem's bassist uh, he did it to look like a corpse it wasn't um for show or for shock value or to make a point he, he did it because he wanted to be seen as a corpse on stage he would also engage in self-harm uh, both publicly and privately he was incredibly depressed and he ended up taking his own life in 1991 um his suicide note apologized for the mess he left behind he was he was never officially diagnosed with Qatar, so this is the thing. Um, so you can't say he definitely had it, um, but he did display a lot of symptoms. Uh, according to Mayhem's drummer Hellhammer, um, Dead was uh, depressed, melancholic, and dark. Um, Mayhem's guitarist Euronymous would claim that death, death, that Dead did not eat, and uh, he did that to look like a corpse and to have like to look emaciated, to look like you're starving. Um, the person that replaced him, the singer that replaced him, uh, Occultus, said that Dead had many visions that his blood had frozen in his veins and that he was dead. Um, we'll never know for sure that if, if Dead had it either way. I personally believe he did. Um, but, you know, it, he committed suicide in 1991 without ever being diagnosed so we'll never know um i happen to believe that he did and if he lived in a place and a time and with people who were more supportive of him he might have been able to get the help he needed uh, his suicide note also left um the song life eternal as as a last salutation and um the last they were the last lyrics he ever wrote and they feature the lines, a human destiny, but nothing human inside. What will be left of me when I'm dead? There was nothing when I lived. So, yeah. Don't really have anything funny to end on. But, um, yeah, Demistrius Dunstan, it's a great album. <laughs> Bag Beckoners.